the grade cricketer is a Twitter stream. It's about playing crickets at the grade level. Boys! Get a few today, did you? To be honest with you, I, um, I hate grade cricket. <laughs> uh, I went into to play for a team called um, oh, the Menace Kid. Obviously, sharing is always a big issue, a big issue for, for young kids coming into a senior cricket team. I was like a wizard league. Um, a bit of advice. Of advice yeah. sort of one. I refer to the great cricketer here and I'll say, this will do a little bit early. Boys! And welcome back to the great cricketer on today's show. We're talking about the 100 looks like cricket, looks good. How do we feel about it? I don't like the graphics! Australia complete a, de- a demolition. A demolition of the West Indies as is our want and need. We're previewing England and India. Besto's back, baby. Also, Coley had a net session on YouTube Live for some reason. We're, we're reviewing Sri Lanka v India, or before we get into hashtag Ask TJC, Nick, the comp dog Compton, is on the show. This episode is brought to you by Budgie Smuggler. You can use the code CHAMP for free custom design at budgiesmuggler.com. My name is Ian Higgins. Sam Perry is he. Pezzy lad. Hi. Hi. Ram Avind writes in. And he says, I come to know, uh, sorry, I came to know that France cricket has a silver medal at the Olympics. And I lost my mind. I did some research on cricket and Olympics and was shocked even more. Came to know that Higos was a silent emerging cricket dada flexing his USA cricket powers against the greedy big three who have prevented cricket for long from the Olympics, only to keep their coffees full and protected. <laughs> coffers. And also their coffers. <laughs> and their coffees full. That's important. A silent guardian, a watchful protector, a dark knight. My question is, do you think meme formats such as the 100 and T10 have a chance to represent cricket at the Olympics? And surely it can't get better than this to shove modern cricket in the face of the purists. Regards from Chennai Ram. What do you want to do with that, mate? Happy Olympics to you. Hey, happy Olympics. Are you I'm, enjoying them? I'm consumed. I'm, I'm completely consumed. I hate that we have to do this. As much yeah. as I love it. Against, against morality, ethics, logic. It's a, it's a movement Australia's besieged by ethical corporate quandaries. And yet... I don't care. And yet a gold cap in the pool <laughs> trumps all. When that's chasing that little, that little yellow line... See you later. Get out of here. I'm all in. It just it just reveals what a basic bitch I am. Yeah, it really does. But I still will succumb to it and go for it. He goes, I don't know what it is about established professional sports mm-hmm. yeah. that kind of suck at yeah. the Olympics. 100%. There are some exceptions, but in the main, yeah. I like to keep them separate. Like Gotta many things in my life, you got to yeah. keep them separated. Yeah. And that's what the offspring was singing about. Like your wife and your girlfriend. I like the Olympics separated from that, and I think cricket. I think cricket. Uh, you know, it applies to cricket as well. Like I, I like the amateur aesthetic. Mm. I want the purity. I like seeing rigs that are sports science rigs, but not ultra sports science rigs. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I like Guernseys without sponsors. Mm-hmm. I like the the absence of lipstick on a pig marketing mm. of the Olympics. Mm-hmm. Again, I, I understand. Mm. The entire thing is probably corrupt. And as we go to where it will probably fall over due to COVID. It's 2021. Mm. We can't enjoy things anymore. Mm. But while it's been on, I, ha- I have enjoyed it. Is Mab- uh, are Maybelline sponsoring the pig hunt this year? Well, if they're not, and if they're listening, <laughs> do what you want. Uh, I- I'm still getting over Australia's bronze at the Commonwealth Games in 1998 at cricket. I think most people are. How did Steve Waugh... Yeah. Not ensure a mm. gold medal at that time. This yeah. was Howard era Australia. That's right. We believed in gold medals as much as we believed in anything. Mm-hmm. Steve Waugh was the captain. Mm. It was the, the Tory liberal axis mm-hmm. of sport. Funding was coming in. Mm-hmm. We had an emerging great side. Mm. Stop the boats. Uh, you know, it's a joke and a serious blight on his copybook that, that actually has been covered up and requires uh, a little bit of exploration and investigation uh so yeah it's a failure but it's been hidden yeah it's been hidden from us a little bit Mm. there only exists one photo of australia playing cricket at the commonwealth games and steve wall playing a slog suite with his eyes closed yeah a mark boucher keeping a young mount boucher keeping Mm. and who and who won that gold medal rm williams who uh, (laughs) south africa yeah 
Uh, I hope that answers it. I that, like that, and that I, wasn't match fixed. I like well, I like <laughs> who was alive. I like, I like that France has a medal. The Olympics, it yeah, just, it goes in to, the nineteen hundred Olympics first in Paris, inter- first international game, USA versus Canada. Central Park mm. was set out for cricket fields mm-hmm. when it started out. Then mm-hmm. A. H. Spalding, rivals with Aaron Williams, yeah, said real men play baseball. Cricket yeah. was done. Cricket got outfit in later. America. Get out of here. Mm-hmm. Um, I am. I agree with you in that, like the the sports that are in the Olympics, like those sports, the pinnacle of that sport needs to be a gold medal at yeah. the Olympic Games, mm-hmm. the Olympiad yeah. of sporting games. Okay, yeah. when I see Novak Djokovic having a serve in Tokyo, yeah, pff, fuck is that? You First don't... of all, he's a coat. Mm-hmm. Let's make that clear. Used to be funny. Used to get used to get behind him. Now he's going to break all sorts of records. He's probably going to be statistically the greatest player ever. Much like Morley is, but we really know number who the number one is. You're saying Novak Djokovic used the Murali of tennis? Yep. Mm, yes, I am. <laughs> yep. Haven't thought about that, but yes, mm. I am. And so you know, when I'm looking at like you know the K one. Or I'm looking at the hundred fly, or I'm looking at some archery, archery, and you know I'm looking at, at some archery, archery <laughs> <laughs> from the Argentinians. I like to see gold medal for those yeah. people. Novak Djokovic doesn't give a fuck about a gold medal. Yeah. He wants to win the French. He doesn't deserve Olympic ring tattoo. No, now that would be the first thing that I would get. I, I actually, I actually did get an Olympic ring tattoo because I but that was, just I, the one I, ring. I, yeah, <laughs> well, I've only been to one Olympic Games, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. So so yeah. Uh, uh, so cricket at the Olympics now. So the the idea about this. So Ram actually uh, left a, a link here through Forbes, which you know is my bible. Um, and they're trying to get it into LA twenty twenty eight. Not bad. Yeah, and the hundred could be could be could be that. You'll uh, take it. Fuck yeah, take it. Yeah, well, I suppose is is the hundred the three on three basketball of cricket? Hey, that can get in the bin, can't it? Three on three basketball. Now, now some some handball, some four court handball, four square handball, four square handball, hundred percent. Yeah, hundred is a meme format, says Ram. Well, we're going to get into that, but uh, yeah, it's a, look, it's a it's a good question. I am enjoying the Olympics. I have a thirst for gold. It's yeah. shameful, but there it is. The heart wants what the heart wants. Of course, you can get uh, now on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash great cricketer. We went past fifty episodes this past week. And you can get in the entire back catalog. Back catalog. Jeez, I can't talk today. I'm excited with gold, gold, gold on my mind. Um, the entire back catalog of the 50 Ask TGC Fridays, uh, interviews, long form writing, it's all there. Patreon.com forward slash Grey Cricketer, if that is your want and need. Also, uh, last week I uploaded, and I think I've discussed this on this show, I uploaded CCTV stills of mm. me shadow batting and. Um, yeah, it, it received more engagement on Patreon than anything we've ever done. Um, just a litany of yeah. anonymous blokes remarking yes. on uh, my appearance, my mm-hmm. grip, my pickup, my yeah. clothing choices, yeah. the size of my hands, uh-huh. uh, all the usual categories. So, uh, c- completely dismantled uh, yeah. as a human, socially, physically, economically, mm. culturally, spiritually. We'll get on to Prithvi Shaw in a moment, who's just joined the Indian squad, but he said after he was dropped from the Adelaide Test where they got bowled out for 36, he felt worthless. Could you relate to Prithvi? Well, no, I actually felt wor- worth more because our, our patrons actually grew. Um, so <laughs> I will continue to debase myself. Right, okay. Knowing that those who sign up to do so are still yeah. giving me at least 30 cents. Uh, on the dollar. Beauty. So, you know, we all make money in our own ways. Now, also, Pe- <laughs> also Pez, uh, we will be doing daily episodes on YouTube uh, for the India-England test series, five test series, dailies every day. The videos will obviously be on YouTube. The audio will be exclusively on Patreon. It's patreon.com forward slash great cricketer. If that's how you consume TJC, the hundred Pez. Mm. Looks like cricket looks good. Pe- positive review so far for the most part. A lot of people were scared about it, but, you know, a few fucking wet cunts, don't get me wrong about it. It's been like, nah, see you later. No, I, I just can't get on board with no, I'm I, I am leaving the game. I've had enough. I'm leaving cricket forever. Um, bit of that, but also for the most part, I don't know. I like it. Seven games so far, one abandoned due to rain. Mm-hmm. Trent Rockets are two from two. Mm-hmm. They smashed the Southern Brave. What do, we, what do we call them there? The Brave? They smashed the Brave. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, they got short, Darcy Short, 
Alex Hales, Dawood Milan, uh, they've all had an impact already. They've also got Rashid Khan, three for in the second game. Yep. Uh, Marchant Delanger, Pfeiffer, then Threefer. Uh, Not bad. Andy Flowers, their coach, he tested positive for COVID before the last game. Yeah. Joe Root's been getting changed in separate rooms. <laughs> so the test series is still intact, I think. He was just chubbing up. Classic play. He goes, uh, yeah. it is, it's still cricket. Jonathan Liu wrote that like Sam Billings, you know, he brought it home for the Oval Invincibles, the Invincibles. in front of, of 20,000, mm-hmm. uh, primetime, BBC. Yeah. Not bad. A couple of million people watching not, the BBC. Not bad. And I think the argument's starting to be made that Maybe cricket was always good. You know, this is old wine in new bottles. Yeah. Uh, don't be don't be fooled by the new bottles. This was always good, which is why people are upset with 100. But now there starts to be some kind of agreement. They're like, oh, th- whatever this is, is good. Mm. Um, just that those bottles are being sold in the shop that everyone buys from, you know, a.k.a. free-to-wear TV. So yeah. a new wine shop is, going with is TV, free-to-wear TV. So yeah. that's just uh, analogies actually help make connections mm-hmm. and communication. What's beef jerky at the counter? Mm. <laughs> Left arm wrist spin, which is making a resurgence. Yeah. It seems to be a conversation, he goes, about whether people are now converts to the 100. Right. Um, but the hun- it's it's neither here nor there. Like, the 100 will probably go through a life cycle like the BBL yeah. has. You know, people will drop in. They'll mm-hmm. drop out. Mm-hmm. Um, but it will become part of the furniture, mm. the 100, because there's so much money in it. It must become part of the furniture. Mm-hmm. Um, better players will come in. And so, like, for the... For the initiated, if you like cricket, it's just a little bit of froth on top of the bubble yep. of test cricket. Yep. A little bit of froth on top of yep. that yep. while you're having a froth, yeah. if, you, if, you, if you follow me. Oh, frothies. And for the uninitiated, it's something good to keep an eye on while you're doom scrolling on social media. Yeah, just right? on the background. You're scrolling. When you look up, you don't even see the cricket. You just see those graphics on the side. Yeah, like, yeah. How many runs or how many balls? Mm. Yeah, okay, that's it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that's about as good as cricket can do mm. in this hyper ADHD media environment. I think and if you scoff at that, Last comment. If you scoff at that, you didn't grow up with the internet or you're a hermit of some description. Mm. And there's nothing wrong with being a hermit. I'm just saying you're one of those two things. I also understand to a degree that um, – because we're not in the UK and so we don't understand the full um, implications of like the impact it's having on other forms of cricket, right? So I'm just consuming it when I'm watching it on my TV at the moment. It's just a TV show. It just exists and it's like this is a good thing that I'm enjoying that I'm watching – because I've never watched the – the Vitality Blast before. I like catch like if someone does something really good or like mm. I know for instance like Josh Inglis, the Western Australia week game, he's done really well playing for whoever he's playing for over there. One of them. Leicestershire? No, that's not right. Um you know, he, he's he's had a he's had a he's had a gangbuster summer over there. Um so you know I can keep keep my eye on that capacity. But like this tournament, England deserves a world class domestic league that they like but they've never had it. Mm. They just they just never had it. And this tournament they've got right now, like the game that was on last night, which was Trent Rockets and um, Northern Superchargers. Northern Superchargers. Thank you. Yeah. Now that was a, that was a sensational game of cricket, which Alex Hales came through in the end, held his bat forty nine out of thirty four or something like that. Um, fuck, he's such a fuck, he's such a good player, and he'll never play for England again. One mistake here, boys. Um, he got he got roughed up by Steve Reid a few years ago in. Um yeah, that's right. That's mm. right. We actually had Steve Reid in the show, didn't we? Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. When was that? It was like five years ago. This is Greg Greg's good comp. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, very strong. Um, and so, like, this competition was going to have, like, Warner was going to be playing this. It was going to be a whole, there was gonna yeah. be a whole host of, like, Aussie players. I think Stoinis was going to be playing this. Yeah. Christo yeah. was going to be playing Smith. it. A whole, hunch, whole bunch of guys uh, internationally who are going to be playing. So, the, the, the competition mm. is going to get bigger, yep. you would think. And it just... England deserves that because they have such good conditions to play cricket. The fans are there, twenty thousand people all around the all around the country going to great going to games of cricket. What's not to like? Mm. But I'm not seeing the direct impact that it's having on county cricket or whatever. We won't be able to assess it for years. But I wonder as well for those people who are complaining about that if they're a little bit too close to it, just like no, I like this thing that's always existed. But is that thing actually working? Well, it's working in the sense that like England have now got a wonderful um, spread of white ball cricketers. I mean, they've got such wonderful depth, England at the moment, the best I've ever seen in my lifetime. Test match cricketers, well, they ain't, they ain't it at the moment. So. I guess I guess the question would be like, is the county championship being sufficiently damaged where people cannot develop their skills in longer form cricket because of singularly the hundred? I'm not sure that's true. I'm just watching the hundred and I go, fuck, this is good. This is good gear. The women's hundred's going well as well. It's Northern, going better than Northern the men's. Supercharges two from two. So is the Oval Invincibles. Uh, the Indian Jemima Rodriguez hit 92 not out or 43 balls on debut mm-hmm. from Northern Supercharges the other day as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, it was interesting. 
talking to um, Barney Rone off air. He was going to come onto the show until I learned that mm. um, he's actually covering Taekwondo, Taekwondo. at the Olympics. Yeah, yeah. Um, he still offered to come on, but <laughs> he said maybe another time. Yeah. We're going to get into VAR and the Taekwondo. Um, it's interesting. There seems to be a, a like a an idea emerging among the, the journos, I think, that like all of these essential parts um, – they always existed in England cricket and it just wasn't arranged this way. So to kind of retro um, explain all of these new elements mm. as wonderful marketing innovations is is a lie, <laughs> basically. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I can understand people's frustration in that. And yet here we are. Mm. It, it looks like a good comp that will grow and that people are enjoying it. And uh, we had a good chat with Nick Compton coming yeah. out. He, he gives a good answer to the 100 as well. So yeah. very um, – he actually gave great answers to lots of things we yeah. talked about. Really mm. straight, really mm. straight and real. Mm. So we can have more discussion about it then. Um, Matt Parkinson's doing he, – he bowled uh, he bowled Trent Rockets number 10, whose name escapes me right now, but he's playing for the Superchargers. He bowled another he's, – he's bowled like three or four wonderful balls this summer. Bit of a conversation about like, well, he should definitely be bowling in the Ashes. Should he? Because he's never played test match cricket before. I've seen his first class record, average is 23. He's had a good summer. Um, how many leg spinners are they going to bring out to Australia and just absolutely destroy England? Happened to Mason Crane. Happened to Scott Borthwick. Yeah. They just give him a game in Sydney when they're losing 4-0. <laughs> and then we never see him again. Yeah, I think as cricket, like, as cricket evolves and all the different formats evolve, it creates such a major separation between skills across different formats in different conditions. You know, mm. like I think Matt Parkinson is a really good bowler with mm. a good future. Though yeah. for, for leg spinners, which is such a, a volatile, vulnerable art, you know, to um, suggest that somebody commences their test career mm. in that kind of uh, Let's go in play those the ashes, conditions. Mate. Away. Crikey. I mean, that's a way that's a that's a way to set somebody's career back in yeah. a lot of ways. Yeah. If history is anything to go by. Yeah. Um, how old is he? I think he's young. I think he's like 23. Right. Uh, I, mean, I think we're going to – maybe we'll cover this later, but it's the one element of England in Australia that I don't feel is being discussed very much is uh, what their spin options are and mm. is Jack Leach – does he have enough control and enough to his bowling mm. to stop Australia pumping him over the mm. top, getting him out of the attack and mm. getting overs into the quicks uh, legs? Um, and. Could Matt Parkinson do that? Christ, that that'd be a tough gig. Pine Rispin, yeah, he'll be twenty five in October, yeah, um, which is young. And we'll get into the England squad in a moment because they did announce their squad for the England uh, India series. Don Best is back in there with um, with Jack Leach as the two spinning options. I suppose uh, I suppose um, Lawrence as well. If you want to include a bit of that, a bit of Joe Root as well. I suppose. Do you want to get into? Um, well, I suppose you, you mentioned there that Andy Flowers got COVID plus two of the support stuff for the Trent Rockets. Joe Root is the captain of the Trent Rockets. He was playing in the last game when Andy Flower was also part of that mm. squad. But getting changed in a separate room. Separate room. Getting changed in a separate room. So I think Andy Flower tested positive before the game. Before the game. So, yeah. Um, it's just another example. And you see this with the Olympics as well. People like athletes getting COVID before their event started, having to go straight home. Devastating for them personally. But then you look at like how much of a knife edge. We spoke about this a couple of weeks ago. Athlete Giles, Ashley Giles was saying how the summer itself is on a knife edge. We saw Richard Punt get... Um, get COVID. He's now back in the squad as well. And uh, and this whole thing could just fall apart so quickly. Mm. If one person in the wrong setting gets COVID, then That's it's right. all over. That's right. Okay, all good. Hey, uh, the West Indies in Australia, that third game has just finished. The second game was abandoned due to COVID itself. <laughs> um, being uh, So the game the game was going to be played like, I think they called it off about like 45 minutes to go. No, like, no ago. it was like 10 minutes. 10? They'd done the toss. Holy shit. Yeah. Who was going to bat? Don't know. So, uh, we would have yeah. fucking smashed them. <laughs> Um, I don't know what the fuck to make of this uh, this three ODI series, mate. Um, Mitchell Stark bowled really well. Yeah. He's got like 11 wickets, I think, 5-3-3. Three, and three. Showed his class. Wonderful bowler. Yeah. Wonderful bowler, especially with the white ball. Um, and Joel Wilson had hilariously bad. Yeah, well, what, yeah, so what we expect. He's my favourite West Indian cricketer. We were sitting together as he... he absolutely <laughs> botched a decision this morning. He, he checking called, a he, bump ball. Checking a bump ball when it was probably an LBW appeal. Like, uh, There's so much going on with the big fella. They've won the series, Australia 2-1. I suppose they'll look back. It's Well, it's not lucky. They, they won They won the ODI series too. When they, they played the better, better ODI cricket across those three games. Yeah, uh, They'll probably look at the series and go uh, at the tour and say, well, we've won three out of eight games. Mm-hmm. You know, We learn a few things. Uh, overall, we, we come out of it 
with more knowledge than when we started. I think we all come out of it with more knowledge of where yeah. Australian cricket, yeah. what, what Australian white ball cricket anyway is. I mean, lots of better we didn't uh, play. It, the, the tour almost felt towards the end like it was um, not so much. I wouldn't say like a rabble, but you've got Moses opening the batting. You've yeah. got Dan Christian batting eight, not bowling in mm. an ODI game. Uh, almost, almost trying to give the impression to people that this is an obvious R and D tour, mm. um, which again I still don't accept that it, any Australian side going overseas should be yeah. just purely experimental because we're missing four or five players. Again, other international sides can cope when they've got to put their twos and threes out. Yeah. Um, the deck seemed ordinary in West, yeah. in the West Indies, and by yeah. that I mean it wasn't 300 plays 300. Well, the, the three ODI games are all like 140 plays yeah. 160 kind of, kind of gear. Um, good to see. Alex Carey succeed as captain, yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, 60 odd in the first game, rebuilding in innings that they went on to win. Uh, there was a moment in that game where the winners were five or six for nothing. And then he brought Zampa on, and Pollard was just destroying Zampa mm -hmm. over after over. And he still gave he still gave Zampa another over. He didn't actually get a wicket, but mm. I just like the idea just That's from a captaincy. But yeah, and it was just great. <laughs> just like watching leggies, really. <laughs> I mean, he gave Zampa a third over as well, which I thought uh, that's a. Yeah, that's how to win me over. To me, Alex Carey is a mature person who carries himself with a little bit of grace and a little bit of class. Yeah. I, I think he's somebody to keep in and around the side to use an AFL-ism, and I should because he played AFL and also holds a Sharon before he goes out to bat. So we're we talking about skeletons? We're trying to replicate New Zealand? Well, this is... He fit right that team. Exactly. Mm. The question these days now is, you know... Would, would How do we become like New Zealand? Wouldn't Australian get into the Kiwi side? That's how far we've fallen. Jesus, because you say that in rugby, and it's a fair, it's a fair uh, question fair, to ask. Yeah. Would, would you make the, would you make the All Black side? The answer's and now the we've same. got to ask. Would they make what are they called? Silver fern, whatever these guys, black caps, black caps. Yeah, would he be a black cap, Gary? I think he would. I think Just. The silver ferns are the soccer team, isn't it? Yeah, is it? Are they the hockey netball? Mm. Obviously, right across New Zealand, sporting uh, mm. diaspora. Um, <laughs> Where's Agar and Ashton Agar playing the same game? That was nice. Mm. Another two lovely fellas. Yeah. A couple of big rigs there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That makes you feel good. Mm. Yeah, by, by the end of that tour, because Finch obviously flew home. He didn't even fly. He's not going to Bangladesh. He's done his knee, mm. facing potential surgery as well. Now just fits into this idea of like, oh, geez, this world, this T20 side, if he's not playing in it, now you've got to fill another hole. I mean, that's the thing. Like, like, why aren't we – like, is the schedule so – volatile that mm. like you know it was acceptable that we were ready for the 2020 tournament in australia but because that didn't take place we're now not ready for this because i, I mm. just feel like this team going into the t20 world cup is almost at the same place in their journey as the odi side was going into the 2019 mm. world cup yeah other countries had themselves ready to peak ready to yeah. go for yeah. that world cup completely agree. uh australia was not australia was a secondary third mm. um priority Made behind a semi. The test cricket yeah it was like oh we you know jammy our way to a semi great yeah. great result yeah. boys like barely even focusing on odi cricket now we're going to a t20 world cup mm. almost in the same position if not uh, mm. further back mm. uh, they're still working out their side guys mm. are missing People will say, but COVID has taken place and it's thrown things into chaos. But why does it not feel like that for other countries who too are dealing with COVID? Mm. Um, and yet we're just, I think we're just expected to uh, accept that because mm. chest match cricket this summer, Cummins, Sibley. bit scared, a little bit scared actually of um, what's going to happen in Bangladesh. Because I've got no idea if they're good or not, especially at home, Bangladesh. Oh, going over there for the yeah, next one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For, the, for this next series. Well, it's like you, three, we would three ex of course, expect to turn it on and to be winning. And of course. I'd, I'd expect that they would win. But what's even in, more interesting is if they don't, will we just hear that it's more R&D? Mm. Are we just experimenting? Hmm. Um, England and India? Yep. That's a thing. England test squad is announced. Can I give you the names, Pez? Sure. Joe Root is going to lead the side. Anderson, Bairstow, Bess, Broad, Burns, Butler, Crawley, Curran, Haseeb Hamid. Dan Lawrence, Jack Leach, Ollie Pope, Ollie Robinson, Dom Sibley, Ben Stokes, Mark Wood. A couple of big ones in there. Probably three notable. Ollie Robinson back, probably mm. to be expected. Bearstow is back. Mm. And Haseba Mead is in that squad. That's probably the, those are probably the, the, the three um, significant inclusions. Bearstow back as revealed by Gary Kirsten, wasn't it? Yes, who mm. is the coach of the, uh, Welsh, the, the Fire. Welsh Fire. Mm. And... Uh, <laughs> he a little just, bit miffed. He just he just dropped he just dropped in in his presser just like oh well apparently apparently Bearstow's a uh, a test match player again 
<laughs> the test match squad had never been announced. That was best though, feel about that. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, well, Gary Kirsten doesn't care. He hasn't yeah. got him anymore. He seems like a guy who does not give a fuck, Gary yeah. Kirsten. I yeah. respect that. Yeah, good. Good gear. Haseeb um, Hamid's the one. Haseeb Hamid's the one, yeah. So in that, uh, they the, the county select 11 versus Indy 11. Course, that's a good team. Uh, K.O. Rahul hit 100. And uh, Haseeb Hamid opening the batting at 112. Yeah. Um, and he's a young guy. He's, he's sort of, do you, you, you know about his story? Yeah. Well, he, he, he was a... Uh, like he was prodigal Prodig- runs, yeah, prodigal runs, yeah. yeah. Which mm. we now understand doesn't mean what we think. Don't like give a fuck. But he is a, he is prodigal in a true sense because he's a returned son. He's a returned son. He's a returned son. He's but back, yeah, baby. Well, I think we explained this the other day. Like mm. he, he started absolute gun, did Tell pretty well in India, then just averaged ten for about six yeah. years. They're, they're, and they're good looking runs. Yeah, they're good looking runs, which is in contrast to his mate, yes, Tom Sibley. <laughs> Who's your mate? Yeah. Who's your mate over there? <laughs> so. It seems like he will find his way into that side eventually, but maybe they'll give Sibley the first crack. It's interesting. Just It's hard not to look at this squad and think about the Ashes from the Australian perspective, though, of course, it's a really big series, um, especially in Trent Bridge. It's an interesting one because I think if India if India are going to win the series, they should win at Trent Bridge because it's probably the flattest, probably the best batting conditions in the country, except for the Oval. Trent Bridge, obviously, a high-scoring ground, quite small, quite flat there can be. Um, and also Ashton Agar hit 98 there once batting at 11. Um, so there's that, but I'm just looking at the squad and I'm like, yeah, it's weak, isn't it? I mean, Be- Berso is an interesting one for me back in the squad because I mean, he's a guy who's got, he's got six or eight test match hundreds. It's way more than most of the people in that squad. Um, but it got to a point in his test match career, especially where he's kept getting bold yeah. and test match batters getting bold. No mm. good. Like once he, once that gets figured out, you know, I'd be interested to see if he comes back from that. And he's obviously a wonderfully talented player. He's one of the best white ball players England's ever produced. No, no question about that. Great opening partnership with uh, Jason Roy and the white ball stuff. But I mean, mm. fuck, I, I, you know, he's, he's a guy that if he scores runs, he's a lock for the ashes, but uh, I feel like he could equally fall apart for Johnny. I'm still curious to see how the England selectors treat this five match series, mm. whether it's, put your best 11 on the park with a couple of changes here and there to rotate mm. if you need, or if it, it, it's going to be R and D stuff from them as well. Like, yeah. it, because when Stokes comes into that side, as we foreshadowed in the last series against New Zealand, just Stokes <laughs> just links everything together for them. He just, he just carries so much load. Yep. He takes pressure off other people. Mm. And if you, you know, it's, it's like most sides, like if Stokes comes in, does his job, allows the other quicks to rotate through with uh, quicker spells or a little bit less time at the crease. Mm. Um, Broad and Anderson aren't sha- you know, carrying as much load as well. If Haseeb Hamid can come in and hit the ground running, they solve something in that in that opening spot as well. Uh, you know, Engl- England at home are going to be a good shout. Mm. Uh, so I still think that India are far more balanced and together across the park and they've got the bit between their teeth in test cricket at the moment mm. India I think Coley you know wants to be number one by a long way mm. I think that India would go in favorites but um, e- England if they bring their side together is still a decent show so I'll just sit on the fence cheers <laughs> <laughs> okay in that Indian uh, in that Indian squad uh, so I said before Rishabh Punt is he's recovered from COVID so he's all good now the Indian squad news though is Prithvi Shaw and Surya Kamayadav Great stuff Brought into the squad Breath to replace in. Gil, Avesh Khan, and Washi. Washi. Who were all injured. Um, Shubman Gil had shin splints. So is he still growing? Yeah, long Shin distance. splints are cooked. I remember having those when you're like 13, 14. Very yeah. painful. But he's still growing. He's, he's only young. What? <laughs> is he going to be able to fucking dunk on us in a second? He's, he's only, still he's, growing. He's the only bloke with that facial hair. In the team? Mm. Has Washington Sungar got a facial hair? No, he doesn't. Is Washington Sundar in the team? Ooh, touche. Um, yeah, so as I said before, Kale Rahul hit 100. Um, they kind of shared some runs there and some wickets there as well in that county select 11 game. I don't even know where they even play the game. Probably should have written that down. Now, this Coley net session, why, mm. uh, we just love a Coley net session, don't we, as, as a cricketing public? I think this is big. I think this is the biggest news in cricket this week. Yeah? So eight, uh, did you eight, watch th- it? Uh, no, but 8,000 <laughs> concurrent viewers on YouTube mm, right. live. Not bad. Coley net. Oh, this is the new frontier for content. I think we've seen this, you know, watching people in the nets. Mm-hmm. Perry hats are glue, for example. Yeah. Coley. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, where, where you can kind of insert yourself into it a little bit. Like, uh, I've played the nets. Yeah. I, I Therefore, the I'm Varat Coley. You know, that and like video, like we've said before, video games, first person experience, yeah. point of view, POV yeah, experience. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Some people like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the grade cricket experience. 
You know, this is what I'm saying. But I think the same people are starting to push this kind of content out. Mm-hmm. You know, like fuck Call of Duty. Yeah. I want I want immersive grade cricket politics. Deal with your, deal with your, your teammates in the showers. Mm-hmm. Work your way through the grades. Yep. Do you get to the game on time? Just all that sort of stuff. I, I'd buy the shit out of that. So you know, and how you, nets and how you fuel it? You'd have carrots. You'd use carrots, wouldn't you? And you could never run out of carrots. Otherwise, you die. And and Mark Ward commentate. And he'd let you know if you're running out of carrots. See, it's kind of like The Sims paired with like, I don't know, Cricket 98. Football manager. Oh, yeah. Sims. Mm-hmm. But for grade cricket, working your way up. Yeah, okay. So it's like you have to get social capital to get picked in the team. So you start with their first. Totally. Circuiting, chubbing up in the showers. Yes. Um, dealing with- Do you go to a different? Do you go to a separate room to get changed? That's so right. So you can chub up. Dealing with uh, degenerate volunteers hanging around the club. Yep. Dealing with scorers. Avoiding duties like- Organising drinks, moving the screens, umpiring, scoring, this kind of stuff. Exactly. Mm. Do you take the bowler's hat from mid-off? Depends mm-hmm. what sort of bloke they are. Mm. Are you going out with them that night? Mm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> someone, you know, someone says, can I have some sunscreen? And they want to pay you $3 for it. And you're like, well, <laughs> how do I ostracise this bloke? Oh, he's a good player. A lot of things you've got to weigh up before you even start playing. A lot of things you've got to weigh it's up. It's not an easy sport, is it? It's not an easy sport. Uh, that first test is at Trent Bridge on August 4, which is next Wednesday. Um, for those playing at home, for those big calendar fans out there. And as I said before, we'll be, uh, we'll be doing the dailies on YouTube and Patreon for those interested in that sort of gear. Um, Sri Lanka v India, uh, that ODI series finished 2-1. Uh, the first T20, I think they played last night, Pez. India won that one pretty comfortably, 164 for 5 v. Sri Lanka 126 all out. Boovy, Boovy Kumar, 4 for 22. Yeah. Um, but in that second ODI game, Pez, Deepak Chahar, he wins the game just about single-handedly, scores some late-order runs, pulls India out from the fire, does the job. He's got a great story behind him. Um, and the story goes, which I have not fact-checked, although I have a you know, friend of the show. Um, I can't think of his name. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Venkatesh Prasad. Venkatesh Prasad, Jesus. Uh, he tweeted this, and apparently Greg Chappell said, when he was coaching the side and he was in, in and around the squad. He was in and around the squad. This is about Deepak Chahar. Yeah, that's yeah. right. He said that uh, he was too short and he should not pursue cricket. He should try and find another profession. And uh, here he is a few years later, well, actually probably close to about 10 years later, uh, winning games for India. Although it, it being India B, but still winning the game. That's uh, a great story for him in terms of you know, sticking with it. And also just uh, great that Greg Chappell's bringing that Australian mentality of like, you're not big enough. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I just loving the like. I know at some schools when we were growing up, they were like, you could do physical testing and body length measurements and stuff like that for like for the AIS. Like people go, oh, for your penis, your for your penis. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know if they have markings that in on primary my primary school. Yeah, yeah. Well, what school did you go to? I, yeah, um, I went church school, wasn't it? Yeah, it was actually. <laughs> oh shit, that's what that was. Why were we all getting changed in the room together in front of the teacher? Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, I just wonder what, about it, Will. what are the measurements for cricket, though? Not, And I'm not talking about Seven, penis. eight inches, yeah. I'm not talking about the penis. Okay. What do they look for in cricket? Like if, if you're, you want to be limsy, but limsy applies to other sports as well. Like, are there any specific limbs that need to work well for cricket? I mean, I just think mitts, hands are huge, big hands, mate. Speaking of the Olympics, big hands, you want to swallow mate, that Look ball at in these hands. swimmers, mate. They're fucking coat hangers oh, for days, mate. The shoulders are everywhere. The yeah. back, get out of here. Mm. No hips. No yeah, hips. Yeah, no hips. The backs filled the wide the widescreen yeah. TV. Yeah, yeah. I can't see around you. Yeah, Arnie. Mate, those what podiums. Those, those podiums for the relay. <laughs> They're oh, wide. Yeah. They're wide. Hey, very wide. Wide podium. Yeah, they need a new camera. So yeah, so you're just looking at, like, hey, I t- when was I telling this story? Was that a Patreon? I remember, I remember being down at the um, Australian Institute of Sport and seeing Patria Thomas yeah. doing chins, uh, weighted chins, and the the back was the biggest thing I've ever seen. It was yeah. so impressive. Bigger than Graham Smith? Uh, I've not seen Graham Smith's back though. You yeah. have up close. I've seen it. Yeah, getting a massage. Touch it. I'd love to have touched it. <laughs> I'd love to have crawled on it. Set up, set up camp. You could have, you could have, yeah. I mean, and I said that out of respect. So, but you're right though, because with cricketers, they're just, it's just hands. It's all hands. Yeah. Big. I, I, Dan Christian just missed out on a catch at uh, first slip this morning. Yeah. With Hazelwood bowling, I think yeah. it just it was a slower ball, so I just dropped in front of him, mm. and he just he just dived forward, and mm. like he was just 
he was sort of lying there on the ground, forlorn, mm. having just missed this chance. He didn't drop it. Mm. He took it. And, like, he had both hands around the ball. Mm. And I just the, – the ball may as well have been a ping-pong ball in there. Tic-tac. Mate, the, it's absolute tic-tac, <laughs> mate. The, just the thickness of the mitts around it. Yeah. You just, and then you just look at your own, just shake yeah. your head. It's never going to make it. Well, I'll speak for yourself. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, anyway, it's all heading Absolute up. Absolute mitts. It's all heading up. I, I, like, I like this, Pez, because it's, it's, it's been a weird summer in the sense that um, there's the novel coronavirus happening oh, around yeah, the yeah, world, yeah. but also that in this English summer particularly, there's only been – well, I suppose it's been three test matches so far and heading into August now, we usually be like in the midst of like the main series, but it hasn't even started yet. You know, it's a yeah. later, like the hundreds just kicked off. That's exciting. We had one test match with the World Test Championship final, which was kind of ruined by rain. And then the two, te- the two test matches before then in England were like, well, both teams are just rotating through their B squads. So I'm excited that like, and I hope that both teams get like, just get stuck into a really good test series here. Cause I'm ready for some really exciting. There's a lot test of cricket, cricket coming up. Whilst the hundreds happening at the yeah. same time, which is good. I'm, oh. I'm pumped for the dailies, and I think that from there, mm. almost all the way through to February, yeah. there is an absolute uh, – there's a smorgasbord oh, of, yeah. of cricket and yeah. meaningful cricket. Yeah, it's like yeah. charcuterie. Yeah. Mm, indeed. Uh, and also they announced the rescheduling of the, the – they've announced the second half of the schedule for the IPL. So it starts – I haven't got this written down. September like, 19. I think it's September 19, and then the finals October 15. Yep. And then the World Cup starts about like 45 minutes after that. That's right. Um, so there's heaps going on. Pez, now we spoke to Nick Compton, um, and it was good. You enjoyed it, which I was quite surprising for you. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was good to talk to Nick. You'll see, we we'll, we'll, again, there was someone who came on screen and we just went, hmm, you're an attractive man, and just objectified him for about yeah, five first, minutes first before we, we chatted. First thing we did. Uh, it, was, it was a good chat. I hope people enjoyed But before then, he goes, we have to thank our friends at Budgie Smuggler. Uh, mm-hmm. For putting on this show mm-hmm. in the way that they do, mm. and there's no other way, no other suggestion we could provide for the custom design smugglers that you can get with them yep. using the code Champ yep. for free. Yeah. Uh, then to suggest, it's not great Olympic moments, but it's great Olympic celebrations. Okay. Because we had Dean Boxall the other day. Yes, we did. Ariane Titmus's coach. Yes, we and did. And if you are from the US, listening to this. Yes. Suck a fart. <laughs> <laughs> only if you're online. Only if you're online, yeah, and that sort of stuff yeah. upsets you. Well, that's what uh, I was he was. Say. That, that was the electricity. The way that he was uh, gyrating on that uh, ledge, yeah, uh, was was something that that's you know that that's iconic. Really, yeah. I don't think it needs to be read into relatable. Too much. Well, we yeah. watched the race together. Mm. Fucking pumped up. You were very pumped up. Very pumped up. Yeah. Uh, so I think you could get that on some custom design smugglers. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, when Ian thought one gold, it was just a really slow. Double yeah. fist. Well, he was know? racing again in about half an hour. So, mm. yeah, that's right. He didn't want to ex- he, he didn't expand want to, too much energy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What a great commentator he is. Yeah. They put him on any custom design smugglers. Doesn't matter what context it is. Take that here. Yeah. Hey, Tom Daly won gold medal last night. He's been he's been in like he's been in like seventeen Olympics and he yep. finally won that gold medal. He's won bronze and silver before. A lot of Olympics. A lot of Olympic gear. Mm. Yeah. So so get him on some custom design smugglers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any Olympic moment really. Hard to go past Eric the Eel. Yeah. You know, as an Australian. Mm. For bringing the game into disrepute. I thought he brought it into disrepute. Bringing the games into disrepute. Disgraceful. I think mean, games is about alphas only. I don't understand what that was. Mate, I, I was watching the water polo last night. Me. Fucking hell. A bit going on under that water there. Just kicks for days. Just getting kicked everywhere. A real metaphor for life, isn't it? Really is, yeah. Mm. Mm. Kicking cunts. <laughs> <laughs> Kicking people who can't see you. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be a strange design on some custom smugglers. That just would legs be. Legs underwater. That would That be, underwater actually, shot. Now that you say that, yeah. I would actually just collate all the American tweets that I saw last night about um, Dean Boxall mm. and how much of a disgrace he was and how he was probably abusing his um, his um, his swimmers. Yeah. Just that kind of gear, real salty gear. Yeah. Yeah, I feel it's much better when people do it like that, isn't it? Much better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Australian Twitter came together because life is Twitter. Mm-hmm. He goes, uh, that's at budgiesmuggler.com. Dot com. And our friends at Pilot. He goes. Oh yeah. Who are changing the way Aussie men engage with their physical and mental health? We've talked Finally. about this before. There's issues that have a big stigma out there. He goes. Mm-hmm. And I suppose I can understand why they have a big stigma. We're gonna sort of have a go at it. ED. We don't have to call it ED. It's just erectile dysfunction, mm-hmm. hair loss, premature ejaculation, acne, etc. There's things you can do to sort it out if you want to. Now, they've asked us here to say that it's your mates who have those issues, not you. But it might just be you. Um, head to pilot.com.au and uh, when you go there, 
you will you'll be using an online platform for men's health issues that are best dealt with head on. Uh, you get prescription treatments delivered for ED, PE, hair loss, and more. Uh, you made a chat or you chat to an Australian doctor via message and that doctor will provide regular check-ins for free while you sort those issues out. When you get the medicines, it's fast, discreet delivery, very convenient. Got told by the guy who runs it, yeah. one of the guys who ran it last week, Yeah. Uh, the week before, that people have been using the code. Oh, good. Through us. That code is CHOPKING, yeah. by the way. That's actually just fun to put into a computer. <laughs> you, <laughs> to put you, into a computer. Put it in now. I use my... <laughs> I use my computer as a fax machine, fax machine, you see. Our wiki comes up. Oh, really? If you type in Chop King. I forgot we had a wiki. Images, though. Uh, oh, there's a few restaurants called Chop King, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah, I, I love think, that. I think there's also a hairdresser. Ooh, there's a hairdresser at some airport because we get photos of it all the time. It's in like Portugal or some shit. That pork Chop King. That looks really nice. Do you remember when uh, Richie Berno made Rest in Peace? God bless his soul. Yes. Yeah, and his socks. Mm. Uh, when he was doing pork ads. No, lamb, lamb, they were lamb ads. Yep. And, he, and they are... He was using some sort of Chop King. Yeah, the headline reference. was Chop That. Chop That. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Hall of Famer actually sent it to us. <laughs> there's another thing on here. There's, there's actually a there's a rap artist called Fresh King who's got a song called Nah Chop. Mm, yeah. Of course, System of a Down, Chop Suey. Yes. Mm-hmm. Indeed. Of course. Of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, Mate, what a time to be alive. Just that this, that this is a thing that you don't have to deal with in a face-to-face. You can do it. Privately. Yep. Guys will have these issues. There's no doubt about it. The the service ex- exists for a reason. Yeah. And a lot of people are using it. In fact, if you read up... That's good. Cool. I'm pleased people using it. If you're more corporately minded, you'll see that the, if you are. the group that runs this organization yes. just raised a lot of money. Really? Uh, for themselves? <laughs> for profits? No, they just, <laughs> they just attracted a lot of investment from people who see that there's a lot of interest in this stuff. Have to be. Have to be, yeah. Um, and therefore, yeah. Uh, we're actually going to um, increase our ad price and stuff for that. Yeah, but, that's um, right. We're talking angel investors here, but it's Steve Smith gear. What are we talking here? I don't think you can. I don't think you're allowed to say. Okay, but, for, um, for legal reasons, yeah, or moral grounds, yeah. So that 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 organisation's yeah. name is Pilot. You go to pilot.com.au <laughs> if you want to deal with any of those issues. You're going to be able to do it discreetly. You're going to be able to get your medicines. You may do it all online, or if you need to do it for a mate, which actually would be weird. Like, would you ever, like, your mates, like, say I was just sitting here at the lounge, just yeah, going, like, yeah. mate, yeah. got hair loss issues. Yeah. You're like, oh, I'm just going to jump onto pilot for you there. Mm, yeah. Are you that nice a person? I'm not. No. And I don't know anyone who is. So head to pilot.com.au <laughs> slash TGC, use the code CHOPKING, and you're going to get a free doctor's consult. That's $20 off. Pilot.com.au. Not bad. Here he is. Here's the comp dog, Nick Compton. Okay, the man we've got in front of us here, he goes, firstly... It's fresh from the shower and looking a real treat. Oh, he's looking uh, a real treat. A real treat. A oh, sweet treat. Um, but we're here to do some numbers firstly <laughs> before we objectify him and his appearance. 16 tests, two tons, two fifties, highest score of 117, 194 first class matches, over 12,000 runs there, highest of 254 not out at a tick over 40. That's important. 27 tons, 59 fifties, three first class wickets as well to go with it. Uh, throughout his time playing for England, they never lost a series. Uh, he was a brilliant player for Somerset and Middlesex and, uh, least importantly, once came to a TGC live show in London where <laughs> Jason Gillespie stopped the show to say, oh, day, compo. Um, <laughs> it's a great pleasure to uh, to speak now directly uh, to Nick Compton. Nick, day and welcome to The Great Cricketer. Boys, well, great to be on. Um, I've been following you with uh, with interest, with a, with a few laughs along the way uh, over the last few years. So thanks for thanks for keeping me entertained and, and, and keeping the humour and the... Keeping the keeping the feet on the ground. Mm. A few laughs, you say. Okay, no worries. I, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, not, you, not always. Don't get ahead of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, certainly not. Uh, Nick, uh, Nick uh, on Crick Info, I note that your nicknames, so this is per Crick Info, so I don't know if it's true or not, a, a compo, Chisa, mm. and Ledge. <laughs> ledge is presumably short for legend. Um and, yeah, and this and this bears some exploration because, as we know, in the diaspora of male social interactions, a term like legend can be very layered. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, <laughs> w- w- was the nickname self-appointed? Was it bestowed on you? Can you tell us a story behind being called Ledge? Um, not a big story. Just yeah, I think probably as straightforward as it comes. Just I think one of the senior players at at Middlesex called me legend or something. And I don't know, I, I, you know, that quick info input is, is a very old and outdated. I'll, I'll give you that much. I think it was kind of the first thing I did when I was 17 and 
you know, we had to fill in one of those things. Chesa was Chesney Hawks. I am the one and only. So I've clearly sort of matured since then. And, you know, <laughs> I've become a, a hopefully a more rounded individual since those days. But perhaps I was, uh, um, you know, bushy tailed sort of off the off the sort of boat from South Africa and was quite keen to take on the world at that stage. So mm. I'm sure I'm sure uh I'm sure that's quite well appointed some of those uh, nicknames, but uh, I think they're a bit more low key now. I, um, but yeah, quite funny to remind me of that. Yeah, Chesney Hawks, uh, I think, came from university. I think that was a sort of popular song back then, and um, I think one of my mates called me that, called me Chesa or something. So that stuck. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. It's, uh, I'm mm. I'm curious about that, Nick, because you uh, grew up in South Africa, then you came over to the UK, and uh, you were plucked from school. At- at Harrow, which is apparently something, um, but um, plucked from school to play for Middlesex. And on a podcast last week, you were talking about the experience of going to play for Middlesex at such a young as such a young age. Got blonde streaks through your hair, and a lot of senior pros trying to work you out. What sort of dynamic was there? Because I know as grade cricketers, you know what it's like walking into a room of senior guys. You go straight into a hierarchy. You've got to work your way through in a Lord of the Flies style scenario, yep. as well as playing cricket. What was the experience like for you? I, I can't imagine it would have been too easy coming over from South Africa, being a young upstart with the last name that you have, with a couple of old blokes who have chips on their shoulders. Yeah, you summed it up perfectly. There were a few of those old blokes, probably more than I realised at the time. But it, it's it was a challenge. I, you know, there's no doubt. You know, going back even a few years, you know, coming over to England and, and meeting Granddad and. You know, these Lords Cricket Ground, you know, your grandfather's got a stand, a stand named after him. And, and it, you know, it obviously takes time to sort of sink in. I think I was 13 or 14 when he passed away. So I, and I came over when I was when I was 12 and I, I stayed with him. And, and there you are with these, these big eyes, like, you know, sort of footballs walking around Lords with, with your granddad. And, you know, I mean, Lords is a sight to behold, as, you, as you'll know. Um, and that's kind of when I think that the sort of dream began you know and and the sort of vision of you know wow this is where it's at kind of thing so i and i guess i suppose you fast forward and i've come to the school i, I had a scholarship to a, a pretty famous school over here i was very lucky um and i was there for three years and, and in my last year of school i got contracted with middlesex um and you know i think for so many years you know as a, as a young cricketer you know uh, effectively a great cricketer growing up you know this was the that's what I wanted to do. That was the vision. That was the ambition. That was the passion. That was the driving force behind everything. Um, and suddenly, suddenly you're in it. And I think in some ways there was a bit of an anticlimax in terms of, is this, is this professional cricket? This is everything I've dreamt about. And I didn't find it particularly professional in some ways, you know what I mean? So there was almost a slight disappointment, which, uh, um, I sort of felt like saying I wanted to play for England and, you know, wanted to be a great player one day was a good thing, was a positive thing. But I don't know if that politically was really the best tactics in the world. And, you know, I soon found out that particularly doing my time in the second team, learning my trade, learning what it what it was to be a professional cricketer. Um, and I'm not so sure Middlesex really taught me that. I think it made me frustrated for a long time. Um, I found um, I got quite caught up and like many young players thinking I probably was better than I actually was. Um I, I tried to live up to being this talented potential and tried to impress people. There's no doubt I did that. So my consistency, consistency levels weren't great. But, um, yeah, there, it was definitely a difficult learning curve. I think Middlesex in particular is, is a well-known place for being quite a tough, um, a tough place to play. I, I mean, you know, a lot of the counties are, but I think particularly – quite old school in its mentality you know the gattings the the embrys the um you know mark rampercash was there you know right at the right at the end but um you know you talk to some of them i I don't think it was an easy road and in some ways i think it's held you know without going digressing at all but i think it's held middlesex back in many ways in terms of progressing as a club um it definitely showed when i went to somerset um probably eight years later um and played with the likes of Triscothic and Mm. And uh, Keyswetter and, and all these guys, and, and the club was very different in terms of how it was run. So mm. I'm very grateful for for both experiences, really, because I suppose when you're in one place, you almost get institutionalized. You don't know any better. And you know, being at Compton, being at Lords, the thought of leaving Lords was something I probably not even considered. You know, this was my club, this was my mm. family club. And so on one hand, leaving it, you know, took a little bit of courage in some in some ways, but. 
in other ways, I think I really found myself and, and perhaps only realized then maybe the Compton name was a little bit overbearing. You know, I, I probably never admitted it to myself. Um, probably didn't even know myself until I sort of left. And, you know, I realized that Somerset in, in many ways were a bit more forward thinking, a little bit more Justin Langer like. Obviously, he had been there for three years um, and it had a huge effect on the culture there in terms of taking what was fundamentally a small county and propelling it into the top ranks first division you know finals 2020 finals one day cricket and suddenly you've got a small club down in the in the southwest of of the country and doing amazing things and you know like every plant you can grow them but you've got to keep watering it and um mm. i think what langer or jl did was was get it up there and i think just gothic and i came in the year after langer so i i was very lucky in terms of timing um but yeah going back to middlesex i mean as you say that that was a it was a typical ground, a very difficult grounding. I found myself very frustrated going home. You know, didn't really feel I got the support that perhaps I I would have liked. I, I I wanted to work harder. I wanted to develop my game more, and I felt like it was a bit of an old school. You know, come in, score runs or don't score runs, and it either happens or it doesn't. You know, mm-hmm. um, and that's why I think the importance of you know the support system around you is so, is so vital for, for sportsmen these days and, and, and in the past. And you obviously make it all the way into the into the test setup and you score 117 and 100 at, at uh, Dunedin and Wellington against Southie, Bolton, Wagner. I mean, first of all, how much better are those innings now that New Zealand have won the World Test Championship final and, the, and they're the best team in the world? One of the best knocks of all time. Two in a, <laughs> two in a row, don't forget that. <laughs> um, no, look, I, I think... Um, I think a big, a big, a big challenge. I mean, it was, uh, it was a bit do or die for me. I I'd made my test uh, debut in India, which uh, of mm. course is um, a, a difficult place to go and tour, and particularly a difficult place to make your debut. I mean, you know, suddenly facing Ashwin with a new ball on day one of a test match, and mm. you know, conditions are very different, and, and obviously the Indian crowds. But um, I never really nailed it there. I sort of, I think I averaged thirty five in that series, and. I got a lot of starts and actually felt quite good. And felt like I did, in terms of the series, did it performed a role. But you know what it's like. I mean, you touched on it at the beginning of the show. If your numbers are above 40, you're pretty safe. If they drop below 40, you know, you're not a dead cert. And I, and I think every batsman knows that, whether you're playing grade cricket or school cricket or whatever, you know, it's it's kind of an unwritten kind of, yeah. um, you know, sort of, uh, sort of rule in many ways. So I think going into that New Zealand series, it was very... It was, I needed to score. I needed to get a big score. I needed to get a big hundred. So when I when I played on for Norton, the first innings of the first test match, my dad had flown over, couldn't find a place to stay, so he was staying in some caravan park in Dunedin. I don't know, I don't know who had it worse. I got I got I got Norton my first match in, in New Zealand, and he was in a caravan park. So I uh, I felt I felt pretty sorry for the old man. But um, we caught up that evening, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I guess it was last chance to Luna in some ways. It certainly felt that way. It certainly felt with Joe Root coming and, mm. you know, there's a lot of good players. Bairstow was on the on the sidelines at that stage, albeit in the middle order. But I had to come up with the goods and I remember waking up the next morning and, and there was a little bit of a, you know, that sort of like don't give a shit mentality where you just think, you know what, I mean, I'm just going to go out there. I'm going to I'm gonna walk the walk. I'm going to I'm gonna be confident. I'm going to look at the New Zealand players in the eye. If it's there to hit, give it a hit. And I think the sports psychologist said something to me that morning, and, and, it's, and it's true. He's, he said, if you want a lottery ticket and to put on the England shirt and to go out and open the batting with Alistair Cook, how would you want that one experience to go? Mm. And I'm thinking, well, I wouldn't want to scratch around and nick, nick off for, you know, not many. I mean, you at least go out there and hit like a cover drive down on one knee and hear yeah, the mm. crowd roar and then nick off. You know what I mean? At least you can. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. So, I think that just got me going a little bit. You know, I, I sort of got a full ball, hit it down the ground, and I could see Dad in the corner of my eyes, and it became a bit of a mental routine to just check over there every over. And, and you know, suddenly the good habits came back, and, you know, the end of the day was, was a pretty good one. Mm. So your dad obviously wasn't allowed to move uh, as well, which, which, which we all <laughs> no. understand. So, um, so, so Nick, at this point, you you know you've hit back to back test hundreds. You're averaging forty. That that you know important milestone. The Ashes is around the corner. You've made you then make seventy nine and eighty one against the Aussies for Somerset, um, and then Michael Vaughan starts promoting Joe Root to open the batting, and that's it. 
uh, you don't play. There's a story about Andy Flower that you tell around not being able to field. But it seems to me that more important than scoring runs sometimes at this level, because we hear this from players all the time, is to have like a high-profile sponsor when it comes to selection. Like there, there, there almost seems to be this adjacent set of politics that go on ar- around how you're seen in the eyes of selectors beyond run scoring sometimes. Maybe maybe if your runs are the right kind of runs or you're the right kind of age or, mm. or style, you're afforded a little bit more time. Somebody like you, you know, was no longer the young upstart like the Roots and the Bairstow, so you had to perform every time you went out to bat and maybe the style was a little bit more solid if not spectacular and... I just want to ask, even though you're averaging 40 and you're scoring runs, like, does it great that you then sort of can be at the whim of an older player saying, no, someone new's got to come through or whatnot? And how do you even arrange your political support <laughs> uh, at that level to go with trying to open the batting in the top three for England? Yeah, good question. I mean, you've hit the nail on the head there. I think there's two things to, to really sort of highlight there. One is I think we're in a time or we're in a time then where – People were very much drawn to that. Um, in the past, I think maybe some of my qualities would have been more, say, value or would have been seen as more normal, if that makes sense. Um, I think that the time at that sort of period, I think 2020 cricket, etc., was very much in people's consciousness. Players were were playing more exciting brands of cricket, you know, that word brand. And, you know, the, the likes of myself, Trot, Cook, weren't you know, weren't, weren't things that, that people particularly sort of elevated in, in, in their minds, if that's probably a good way of it. So the likes of Trot, for example, fitted in the same category, had to perform every time, push them over the edge eventually, um, you know, but was a very resilient, you know, resolute sort of player, but also had, I think, timing's everything as well. And I think the timing of... I mean, not so much Joe Root. I mean, it was obvious, very clear that he was going to be a fantastic player. I don't think I, I acknowledge that. I think everyone acknowledged that. But he was fine in the middle order. And I think that sort of Michael Vaughan, you know, it's not one of those where I, I try to block it out. I think for large periods, I blocked it out pretty well. I mean, I sort of tried to be quite sort of have a perspective about it, be quite relaxed about it. I mean, deep down, it it kind of grated me a little bit because I thought, why isn't anyone pumping my tires? You know what I mean? Like I've got some attributes that, people close to me can see I'm a good player um, and I could be a, a pretty damn good player for England. Um, but I think when you're sort of trying to sort of, uh, you know, pump your own tyres or, or or keep sort of talking yourself up, it gets exhausting after a while. Mm. And actually, I didn't feel I needed to. And one of the things I struggled with was I think then the banding about it being quite intense and my personality and, you know, I, I found that hard because these guys didn't know me from a bar of soap. You know, I mean, I might have said, hi, mate, you know, walking past the wicket one day or something. But I had nothing to do with them. Nasser Hussain, Michael Vaughan, you know, and in some ways, you know, Michael Vaughan was pushing his own credentials and he was representing Joe Root. And I just thought that was poor mm. and should have probably been picked up on. Um, I just don't think it was the right noises to be making. You know, and again, I could have said to Michael Vaughan, yeah, Joe Root's going to be a great player and sh- probably should be in the team, but he's not a better opening batsman than me right now. Like, he, you know, he's a middle order player and, and that's been proven, right? You know, mm-hmm. he, that's where he's played and that's where he's become a, a, a serious, you know, world player. But I think those kind of battles in your head are difficult because I think fundamentally you're right. It's black and white. You know, either I perform and I stay in. Um, if the average drops below 40, starts mm-hmm. getting mid 30s, in trouble. Um, you know that, um, but but you you know you also have got a game to look after. You've got your confidence to look after. You've got you know fine margins to look after. Opening the batting, you know one mistake, you know um, a hairline, you know sort of playing miss versus a little scratch is you know the difference. But is is, a, is there's a big difference, um, mm. and I I guess that becomes more highlighted as 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 it got closer towards the ashes and. Yeah, I think it was disappointing because I, I was definitely playing some of my best cricket of my career. I mean, those innings as I played against Australia were probably, I felt like I really played pretty damn well against them. Um, and I felt it was the right choice for that. But it, it sounds a little bit self-indulgent, doesn't it? Sort of sitting here now talking about, you know, oh, da, 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 da. I mean, yeah, at the time it was disappointing. I, I won't lie. It was, it was very difficult. Um, and then to watch 12 England opening batsmen 
you know, go through the roster for the next sort of three yeah. three years or so. I mean, and, and I almost looked at it from a cricket fan's perspective. It was like, it's not really about me. I mean, they can play someone else. It's fine. But they're making a, they're messing this up. Like, what are they doing? Mm. Like, you know, you be careful what you wish for. You know, I mean, as you say, we won every match. Um, the team was doing pretty damn well. And in test match cricket, particularly in England, the ball seems, it moves around. It's not an easy place to bat. And if you want to be consistent, you've got to have consistent players that are going to pride their wickets. Right. You know, and I, I don't feel it's any different today. Sure, you guys get away with a David Warner in Australia on some very good wickets. And, you know, you can have that luxury. But David Warner comes to England. It isn't the same player, is it? Let's be honest. Mm-hmm. So um, there's proof there that, you know, it's not one size fits all. And actually, you know, there's enough players, the likes of KP, the Stokeses that have come through the Bairstows in the middle order, the Roots, et cetera, that can play that role. But I don't, I didn't feel many could play the role I could, you mm. know what I mean? And and that was kind of where I was coming from. Mm. There's obviously another guy who doesn't have the support of the sort of England um, hierarchy or the institution itself is Alex Hales, who just continues to blast runs in every competition he plays in, yet cannot even be in England's C's team, um, mm. even when the entire squad gets COVID. And more runs in the 100, <laughs> and, you know, I, I don't know what he can do. You actually play, you played with him when he was in the test team. He opened the batting, you batted three in South Africa, I think it was. Um, I mean, what was he like around the group then? And then do you think also that that he can do anything to get back into the England setup? Personally, I think it's a it's become a personal vendetta between Morgan and, and Hales, and I think that's poor. I mm. think that he served his time. Um, look, Alex is – I like Alex. I've known him a number of years. Um, he's not perfect, um, but he's fundamentally a decent guy. I think he would probably, by his own acknowledgement, got caught up in things that haven't haven't helped him, but he wouldn't be the first sportsman or cricketer that is potentially – gone down sort of those sort of routes. Um, professionally, I think, I mean, professionally, I think he speaks for himself. I think he's without doubt one of, if not leading opening batsman in world T20 cricket in the story. I don't mm. care. It doesn't matter what anyone says. That is a fact. I mean, he, he does it all the time and how he, how he can't get back in that team. I, I just find it's a shame. I think to give, you know, Morgan's done some good things with England. Don't get me wrong. And, but I think to give a captain that much power, I don't, I don't believe is the right message to be sending. Um, this is a person's life, um, and you're not there to be best mates with the captain and get on the wedding, co- the wedding mm-hmm. sheet for, for Morgan's, you know, sort of event. You know, it's, it's, it's about him doing a job for the team. And you know, fine, Morgan might not trust him, you know, in in social circumstances. But at the end of the day. You can't say you couldn't trust him to open the batting. I mean, that's 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 probably the area where you could trust. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a game of cricket. This isn't, you know, about being best mates. And you get the feeling that it's the power there is so heavily outweighted um, in the captain's um, direction. And sure, you know, he's he's earned that. He's got himself to a place where, you know, he's turned English white ball cricket around. We've seen that. Um, it's exceptional to watch England's white ball cricket as play now. I think they're strides ahead of the rest of the world but um fundamentally i think people deserve a second chance don't they i mean mm-hmm. you know it, it can't be that bad and if it is i mean two guys can get in a room and get on with it you know um mm-hmm. england are blessed that they've got other players so perhaps losing a guy like hales hasn't affected a team as much say a, as it would another side for example um but i still think that he should be in that t20 world cup squad um in the least mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. uh Nick, uh, sp- speaking of white ball cricket, we obviously live in sort of binary uh, culture war times, uh, meaning that you have to declare which tribe or which trench you pledge your allegiance to um, with no prospects for moving or changing your mind lest you appear weak and wrong. Um, with that in mind, the 100, for or against, and what do you say to those on the other side who are therefore wrong and without merit? <laughs> There's no middle ground. What a, co- what a question. I went to the opening last week and I'm going to, I'm going to say four. As a purist, I feel like my granddad would be churning in his grave, but I'm going to say four. <laughs> <laughs> what is, uh, I, I'm curious about that because, um, I mean, firstly, a lot of this conversation is moot because we can't evaluate the impact of the 100, both positive and negative, 
until it plays out for a little while. So it's it's just a fun exercise where you have to declare which which wheel you think what you think will happen. But you're somebody who's spent a lot of time playing county cricket. Uh, mm. I know one of the arguments against the hundred is concerned about the impact on county teams and the levels below that. Um, is that something that you're conscious of, or um, or or is it that the benefits of it outweigh those impacts as you can see it? Oh, two heads. As a player, if I was still playing, um, I wouldn't like it. Um, and I felt fundamentally towards the end of my career, there was a kind of, it's time to go. I'm, I'm, I'm almost glad that my time's come up because the game has moved on. And like it, loathe it, enjoy it or not, either get on get on the bandwagon or, or go and do something else. You know. And I, I felt like I grew up 50 over cricket, test cricket, very simple. That's what I wanted to be. Those were the heroes that I watched, and that's what I try to emulate. Um, as I went through that mid twenties, this T Twenty game comes in. I realised that if I s- sort of swam upstream with the whole crowd, I might be a good T Twenty player and therefore be a good Test cr- a sort of four day cricketer. But I didn't want to be good. I wanted to be very good at one thing, and I, I went with Test cricket. You know, and I suppose. Um, was one of the worst business decisions I've ever made in my life. But anyway, <laughs> you live and learn, don't you? You live and learn. Um, that's why I'm in a one-bedroom flat in London, mate, and not, 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 got the, not got the millions that these other boys have. But no, jokes aside, um, jokes aside, I have to say, look, I know Tom Harrison well. He's come up with this concept. I think there's two ways of looking at it. One, I think it'll work because there's been a huge amount of money and investment in it. And I think that... Um, players will play in what they're paid to play in. Mm. I don't think players really care that much, if I'm being frank. You know, I hate to sort of take away the fantasy, but they just, they'll just play. You know, they're getting paid a lot of money. Mm. It's another white ball. Whether it's 15 or 20 minutes longer or shorter, I don't think makes any a blind bit of difference. Um, I think, secondly, um, the, the, the only issue for me is the diluting is diluting the cricket brand around the world. I mean, how many more forms of the game are? And I mean, look, fundamentally, I think the ECB, I think it's a bit of a, you know, who's got a bigger, you know, I won't say it, a, a sort of, uh, <laughs> who, who, who's, who's got a bigger chest really in the sense that they didn't want to, they wanted to come up with their own brand and try and push it. And, you know, I mean, is, is Australia going to come up with something different? Is New Zealand going to come up with something? I mean, where does it stop and start? And, um, fundamentally, I, I think that that's making it more difficult. You look at women coming to the game now, drug it more women and families into the into the sport. Now that's great, but I would have guessed that a lot of women who have, who are going to a hundred game have arguably been to one, say Thursday night T Twenty game at Lords or the Oval. They now come to the hundred, and there's a whole new thing they've got to learn. You know what I mean? And I mean, I don't. Re- I've got to be honest. I don't understand the rules yet. You know, all I, all I looked at was there's a hundred balls. There's now 70, there's now 50, there's now 30. Who bowled it? What end and where? I didn't really, <laughs> I didn't really know. I just, I just saw the balls going down. So I guess in some ways it's supposed to be a lot more simple, but I don't think it has been that sim- – I don't think it's been simplified hugely. I mean, will that change over time as we get more accustomed to it perhaps? Mm. Um, but look, I certainly the razzmatazz, um, the time of the year it's being played has been prioritised. You know, I don't think – they're very concerned about the future of county cricket, to be quite frank. And I think that's why I say I'm talking now as a fan rather than a, a current player. But I think as a current player, I'd be disappointed because for me, test cricket has been, you know, the the, the form of the game that I wanted to and, and I felt is the game that we should judge ourselves on. Mm. And that's been pushed to the margins. And I don't know if England's test cricket is in a great place. Mm. Finally, from me, Nick, uh, you've been very generous with your time. Uh, it, it wouldn't surprise you to know that many in Australia simply do not rate England's top three when it comes to test cricket, <laughs> with many reserving particular scorn for Dom Sibley's rate of scoring and technique and style. Um, <laughs> that said, Athers the other day mentioned on an Australian podcast that, that the decks haven't been great in England these last few years. So the question is, do people understand how difficult it is to open the batting in England in particular? Uh, and for that reason, do they need to lay off Dom Sibley and Co. One, the decks have been tricky. I don't think the quality of wickets were were that great, particularly in my last couple of years. Um, and 
but in terms of Dom, I, I just don't know whether his style, and I, I honestly back him in terms of having the resilience to bat that way and to you know, be as stubborn as he is and to wait for the bowlers to come a bit straighter so he can score. But I just wonder whether, you know, bowlers are good enough now that they're not going to do that. And um, I don't think it's so much comparing Dom Sibley and sort of equating him to the wickets. I think his style, um, you know, I, 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 I can see, for example, I can see Hamid coming in to play against India. And I have a feeling they might go with um oh who's the number 3 um who's a bit more elegant youngster Crawley Crawley, Crawley. Mm. I think they might stick with him you just get the feeling that he keeps playing in all the teams and he keeps getting a go and mm. I think they really want him to succeed and again I think that's a case of also being drawn to a bit of glamour you know when he hits the cover drive it looks pretty good you know but he averages 30 in first class cricket and you sort of do think how's he playing test cricket however that's where we're at. And you have a feeling that they might might stick with him because I can't see, I can see Hamid playing, but I can't see Burns or Sibley batting three. Can you? So mm. it's a tough one, but you also feel that whoever plays now in this series, they're going to have to play them in the, I mean, what do you do? They're going to have to play them in the ashes. You know, you can't sort of play the guy in the series and start with a new guy in the ashes. So it's a tough call for these guys. I, I do think that long-term Sibley has I look, I, I like his attributes. I you know I can't sit here and say I don't. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it can be, you know, people say I was painstaking, but when I watch him, I think, gee whiz, like, <laughs> I had a few more shots. I had a few more shots than that, didn't I? <laughs> uh, Nick, it's late where you are. You look like you're, you know, just getting ready for a, for a nice sleep. Again, you're looking great after your shower. Um, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> looking fantastic. Looking fantastic. Um, thanks, so, thanks so much for your time, mate. We'll catch up with you soon. Appreciate it. Boys, great work, eh? Thanks, really enjoyed it. Hashtag Ask TGC. Pears E Lad. Mm. Chuck E Cheese. Is that a real thing that exists? Yeah, it's a real thing, isn't it? Yeah. It's not just a Simpsons gag. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, Will Curtis writes in, Pez, uh, before this next Olympic final. <laughs> <laughs> he says, Quick one from me, bit of context. I played cricket up to the age of 15 before giving it up as I actually wanted to enjoy my Saturday afternoons, get a girlfriend, see the world, etc. Following the summer of 2019 with England winning the World Cup and Ben Stokes breaking Aussie hearts at Headingley, I was inspired and wanted to start playing again. During the short and 2020 cricket season, I joined my local village club and immediately fell in love with it again. Made a few runs, took a few wickets. Happy days. As we were forced into lockdown after lockdown this winter... Sorry, as we were forced into lockdown after lockdown this winter, I was buzzing for the start of the cricket season. Having done all right the year before with my brother's kit, I couldn't wait to see how well I'd go with some fancy new gear and a new stick. I didn't care how much it was going to cost. I went all in and was fully kitted up for the new season. However, the last two and a half months have been the most miserable of my whole fucking life. Oh, my God. My, <laughs> my confidence carried on as I hit a few 50s in preseason. However, during May, our first three games were rained off and my league scores since then are as followed. 7, 1, 0, 21, not, mm. 0, 1, 0. Mm. Two of those were golden ducks. Yesterday was a final straw, I think. Having to suffer the immense humiliation of walking out to the crease, taking guard, playing a few practice drives, only for your off stump to be sent flying first ball for the second time in three weeks is too much. I've had the old boys who don't net ripping me, ripping into me all season and have started an inquest into how I'm consistently still batting in the top six. The skipper just tells me, you need to move your, you need to move your feet more in the bar every week. Yesterday, I even got fucking outfitted by the 16-year-old barmaid at, at our club. Mm. She's come up to me in front of the boys and said, that was painful. Have you stopped crying yet? Nigging. <laughs> I suppose I haven't really got a point to this story. I'm more just using it as therapy. Even if you don't read this out, every week I tell myself, well, it can't be worse than last week, and somehow it is. Why do we fucking bother playing this shit fucking sport every week? It was 28 degrees in the UK yesterday. I could have done anything. Instead, I'm bowling a few overs of litter (coughs) 
which gets smacked around by fat 60-year-olds, being laughed at by children, and then crying myself to sleep at night. Jesus. <laughs> Despite what this sport does to me, both emotionally and physically, I know I'll still beat the Nets on Tuesday and Thursday this week, probably smoking the ball everywhere, owning the shop Saturday and get another fucking duck. It's no surprise Dev- Dad never wants me, wants to come up and watch me. Sorry. Cheers. And, uh, and, he, nev- and he never wants you. <laughs> <laughs> it's no surprise Dad never wants well, me. Uh, look, there's no um, – look, thanks, Will, Curtis. There's no <laughs> – <laughs> twist, there's no twist to this. So Will, Will is literally just detailing the average experience of playing cricket. Yeah, mate, it sounds like, it sounds like a good season to me. It's just a couple of sunny Saturdays. I, I don't understand like what the what the conundrum is. I mean, why do I play? Yeah, that's rhetorical. Yeah, yeah, it's all you've ever known, and you have a deep seated fear of change. Yeah. but it's that's just a season, mate. You've like you've gone back to play. Y- you're making no runs because yeah. no one really ever does make runs. It's rare to make runs. Yeah, and um, you, you know, and then other blokes are sledging you because yeah. that's what blokes do. That's, yeah. yeah. We were just talking to Nick Compton before and he was talking about like 40 being like that sort of watermark there where yeah. if you're above 40, you're all good. Anything yeah. below that, you're struggling. He's like, it doesn't matter what level you're at, if that's, you know, if that's grade cricket or school cricket. Yeah. Sorry, great. If you're averaging, if you're averaging 39 in grade cricket, mm. you're about to play a test match. Yeah. Uh, the other day, uh, and, and this person will remain nameless, but Facebook friends with a few guys that like some of them played some good cricket you know, played first class cricket in another decade. And one of these guys put up a picture of himself and he's looking really fit. Looks really good. I saw the same photo. I thought yeah. I thought the same, yeah. Looks really Looks good. good. Yeah. Uh and and there's a lot of names underneath who are commenting. Right. Okay. And a lot of names that are recognizable from sure, cricket in sure. the nineties and yeah, the noughties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um and ninety five percent of the comments are like looking really great, mate, looking good. Mm. Most guys are well out of their careers and mm-hmm. stuff and they're just mm. being nice. Mm. But there was one guy who just wrote tits Question mark. <laughs> and this guy played for Australia. <laughs> and objectively, the, the, the man in question in the in the picture looks good. He There's looks no good. way he looks anything other than good. I, I actually noticed how well he was looking. Yeah. Like fit. Yes. Yeah. And and still this guy who apparently gets into a lot of online he played for Australia a long time ago. Right, okay. Um but just likes to get into online arguments and stuff. But yeah, just yeah. his response to that was tits. <laughs> question mark and he's no he's not fucking you know yeah yeah it, it, he's no great shakes he's not right. chris hemsworth right okay and it just i mean that just reminds me of like this story as well it's just mate. like oh you score runs you don't score runs oh you look shit move your feet it's just that's just yeah bloke. mate that's just social dynamics when i read that like that triggered me as well because i remember that yeah I, I i'm sure i was told this story before but i got bowled the last ball before lunch once lunch once at chatswood oval um and uh like just volunteer Don T came up to me and he goes, I oh, just need to move your feet there. I like, just fucking last ball before lunch, devastated. Like what what was what was the window where you could engage in other humans after you got out? How long are we talking? Oh, a long time for me. Yeah. I, I, I didn't like carry on, like make a big fuss about it. No, no, but no. I was I would be pretty pissed off. I it'd be the better part of an hour, I reckon, for me. Mm. So this was it depends like, how many you got. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. 22, 23 plus. Oh, yeah. Cock a hoop. <laughs> Come out with a sombrero on, <laughs> playing some music, boom box. Here's where I meet tonight, boys. 24 or fucking 72, you beauty. No, yeah. Oh, good. Can't no drop shirt. me. shirt. Can't drop me this exactly. week. Bit of sun. Cracking gags. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Secretly upset with yourself. Ah, mm. oh, mate, no good. No mm. good today. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. Go and check the, the score. What are we on? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah what are we on? They say they say number. I'm assuming it was white noise to me. I was looking directly at my score. Last one, Paz, I reckon. David O'Halloran writes in, or does he? It's Jack Stain writes in. God damn it! This is a fucking essay. Um, Jack Stein writes in. Brothels, flat caps, and Birmingham. Let's come in. Good morning from a drizzly British summer day here as I digest your fantastic podcast. And when you started talking about rub and tug joints, it made me remember an incident from the 2019 Ashes. I'm a pretty shit cricketer, but have played for the Authors CC over here, who I think Sam had a few sticks with and hit a few runs here and there. It's a bit more than that, but anyway. Um, (laughs) Let me set the scene. I'm a chef by trade. And it just completed a show for Foxtel with an Aussie crew going around the world, cooking British food in places like Thailand, Darwin, Cape Town, Zagreb, etc. Most of them fucking hated all of it. <laughs> Cultured. 
The director and producer were two Aussies, one very much in the Bondi hipster mold. I won't use his real name, so I'll call him Josh with an E at the end. Uh, he had a penchant, a penchant, for making hipster observations about places we visited, culminating in him always wanting a local beer, some craft shit. <laughs> <laughs> I wish there was a guy like this when I was playing for the authors. There's yeah. nothing like that. Being a chef who is constantly bombarded by the next best thing in food and drink, I just regress to things I like but aren't craft in any way. Beers like Heineken, Crown, Stella, etc. Cue to Josh E. in Rotterdam asking for a local beer. The bar lady says Heineken. I started laughing to myself knowing what would come next. No, can I get a local lager? Heineken is the local lager, was the response. <laughs> so we had a load of Heineken and got belted and decided to go to the Ashes in the UK. So I decided to invite the Aussies to Fortress Edgebaston to sit in the Holly Stand for the first test day four. We stayed in central Birmingham. Josh and Matt, with, both with E's at the end, were really <laughs> keen to walk to the ground. I was like, why would you want to do that? It's a Sunday morning through Birmingham, which can be a bit interesting with some tough areas uh, like uh, that like a night out. The Aussies, however, thought they were in an episode of Peaky Blinders, taking photos of the rundown buildings and areas between the hotel and the ground. <laughs> People were starting to rise, and you could see there'd been some merriment. Matt asked what all these canisters on the floor were. Did the locals blow up a lot of balloons for something? <laughs> 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 it was clear this area we were walking in was like walking up William Street towards the Coca-Cola sign and turning left. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually quite a gentrified area. Now yeah, it is actually right. quite yeah. nice. Yeah. So Just be careful. An old reference. Yeah. So we walked into another sketchy area, area as the boys took photos and went on about Killian Murphy while I scanned the area for half-pissed brummies who wouldn't take too kindly to Bondi hipster types. This is the moment I saw the man. He looked like he'd walked off the set of a show. He had the flat cap, lung dart in one, uh, in one hand, lighter in the other. There was only one issue. He'd clearly walked off the set and then tripped over because he was sparkoed lying outside a door upside down. <laughs> the shop next door was a sex shop and I looked over at the door and it had a kind of name that made me wonder. Does the Blue Bell Suite seem like the kind of residential block that a bloke half cut would stumble to the door, trip over with his dart, not even lit, and still be there at 10am? Or was it a rub and tug slash brothel in which this bloke had got too smashed and been thrown out by the hookers? Either way, I was sussed. Either way, I sussed the situation was hilarious and fairly safe as he was unconscious but breathing. <laughs> Josh and Matt wondered if we should go and administer some form of CPR or some shit to this unconscious brummy local. I said simply, nah, fuck that noise. He's been kicked out by the hookers and has just gone to sleep on the street. I don't think the boys believed me in any way, but it was clear as day what had happened to this fella. Pretty embarrassing if someone he knew saw him, which is why I only posted a couple of pictures on my Instagram <laughs> of him. Anyway, we got to the Hollies, uh, got the boys belted on local warm piss and watched the Aussies absolutely smash us and destroy Fortress Edgebaston. I kind of blamed that bloke unconscious outside the brothel rather than playing part-time spinners uh, to Steve Smith. Anyways, love the show. Take it easy, boys. Not really much of a question, just a little anecdote. Mm. Um, it's not much to do with it, but... Mm. Um, the it, relationship between cricket clubs and rubs and tugs. Yeah, slash brothels. Mm. Um, that reminds me, I've got to go to the ATM. Um yeah, Edge Bass and what a place. What a ground. Hollies. Yeah, that was good. I, I remember when I like when I first came into grade cricket, a lot of the guys at the club talked about rubs and tugs. Yeah, yeah, same. Oh, I say rubs and tugs, I'm just yeah. using the plural, it's just rub and tug. It was just because that it just fits into that uh, that demographic of like now in my mind they're in their mid fifties, but of course they yeah. would have been about twenty eight, twenty nine. Yeah. But then those guys don't really exist in club cricket much anymore. Mm. In grade cricket anyway, I think like those that age group still play cricket, but just mm. not in the sort of the premier comps of you know, club land in Australia or whatever. Um, but then there's just like this, that's what that's what the great cricketer is founded on. And I'll tell you what it's founded on, mate. Um, it's just like this seedy underbelly of like Australian male in yeah. particular where it's like it's so it was so um, misogynistic and grotesque. Yeah. Super pig. Super pig. Mm, pig Super cock. pig. <laughs> Super pig, pig cock. Has said on, we discussed this on like a, a Patreon episode ages ago that, we, we came to the idea that every club might need a super pig. Mm. Every club needs a super pig. Every successful club. Every successful club needs to have someone where they um, they congregate around the super pig. Mm. They don't engage in necessarily, but they that super pig is required in the club mm. um, because there's like someone that you can like point and laugh at. Yeah, balances it out like mm. Stokes. Yeah, that's right. Side. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I wonder whether a lot of those guys that we looked up to at age who were 27, 28, mm. attending rub, rub and Tugs, mm. or at least 20. When we were like 18. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if now into their, like, what, mm. late 40s. Yeah. 
are still doing stuff like that. We, we did a live show a few mm. years ago, mm-hmm. and um, an old teammate of mine came along. Yeah, it took us that rub and tug after, well, after the show. I was standing around with him <laughs> after the show. I'm just conscious not to be too specific, but yes. and a couple of other teammates were there, and these guys were like a generation older than me, like significantly older. I was really young at the club yeah, and yeah, yeah. whatever. And 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 these guys were very much of that super pig ilk yep. back in the day. Yeah, they were super pigs. And um, it's like super Ted. And then I heard them and married guys. Yeah, I of heard course, them yeah, discussing course, yeah. their next move, which was to go to a famous um, oh, right strip club. Yeah, okay. And then another one said, another one said, like, very earnestly, like yeah. it was a conversation about tax, you know, like, <laughs> said, like, you know, just an everyday chat about the yeah, your yeah, accountant yeah. or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, he yeah, said, yeah. like, I, I don't understand why we'd go to a strip club if we're going to go to a brothel after. <laughs> and I was like, there's my answer. I was like, it's still going on. <laughs> Well, it, but I it's think like if you're, if you're gonna get no, why would you go to a strip club if you're gonna get your rocks off at a brothel after? <laughs> <laughs> so many questions. But that's like that's like getting thrown as before the game. Yeah. Got to get your eye in first, or whatever. So yeah, that world exists. I've only been to a strip club maybe in my life 40, 50 times. No, <laughs> I've only been to a strip club I reckon three times in my life. Once at schoolies, once in the UK. Where was the other time? Maybe somewhere in the cross another time, like back in the day when yeah. the cross was run by the bikies and stuff. Um, and I just found it always the most like surreal experience where like, guys, what are we doing here? What like, first of all, the internet has always existed in my adult life. So mm. it's like, if you really need to look at naked ladies, mm. as is your want, then you can just do that on your phone in the privacy of your own home. Mm. Also, the, the environment of a strip club is so seedy. You go for a beer. Oh, can I just get a domestic lager? Oh, that'd be forty-three dollars. Thanks. What? Mm. Um, and then just the idea—if you go to like a private room, there's no like, there's no touch. Like, it's all just a fucking, just a big cock tease, really, isn't it? That's what they call it. Now I'm the super pig. That was actually the name mm. of a club, cock tease. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but the whole teasing I, your cock for yeah. money. <laughs> okay. Trying to tease the money out of your wallet. Mm. I don't know. I just always found a, a very um. It, it wasn't in any way a sexual environment. That was so gross. It was grotesque. There was just like, there was just other men in the room with you mm. whilst you're being like seduced by naked women dancing on the stage, which you can have no engagement with other than just to look at. It's a problem. <laughs> it's all exploration, isn't it? Like I, I, I mm. would attend strip clubs in the same manner as you did as like an 18, 19 year old yeah. because of the novelty of it. of it. You know, you're in the yeah. cross. Yeah. There are strip clubs there. You've been out. Yeah, let's go. AM. Let's go here. Yeah, this is a thing. Here's yeah. naked women. Okay. Yeah, you know, super pigs at the club are doing this. I'll do yeah. it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I he remember plays like, once. So like when I was eighteen or nineteen, I went to like I went to a religious school, yeah. and uh, I I always had like a fairly um, like a, a a sort of a convivial connection with religion. I didn't observe it any like in right. any serious way, right, but I right, didn't right. like. I, I suppose I wasn't old enough for. Wise enough to go like, hmm, omnipresent God, just mm. one. Not sure about that. Sky, okay. sky Daddy, <laughs> hmm. Again, mm, not sure. Um, so the snake talks. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I didn't really. <laughs> I was just like, oh. It's a talking snake, right? Jesus seemed like a decent bloke. Yeah. And um, that was pretty much where I was. And then. Bit of twos, uh, threes. He would look after twos and threes. He'd talk to twos and threes He blokes. would talk to twos and yeah. threes. Yeah, that was half his problem. Yeah, he talked to shy's blokes, um, <laughs> which is why he was crucified. But. So I had this like duality going on at the time where like I was <laughs> yeah. circuiting very much so. Right. Um, but also I I thought oh, I'm going to – there was like a, a youth group right. um, that they ran out of my school but then for people who'd finished school, right? right? So like I'd go to this youth group on Sunday night and I'd go with my, a mate of mine mm. and we like – we one night I remember we had a fucking massive circuit yeah. on a Saturday night. We'd ended up at a strip club and like this was back in the days where you'd get the stamp – Oh, yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. And like, you just, it was really hard to wash off mm. or you'd just be such a slob the next day. Right. And so we went to youth group um, at like the peak Anglican church of Sydney <laughs> and I still had strip club <laughs> stamp on me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, just remember sitting there, like still probably pissed, just yeah. still sitting there, just, just giggling yeah. at the, uh, you know, sitting in an environment where like women aren't allowed to speak. Yeah, um, yeah, with strip club stamp on me. Yeah, but you know that is what it means to mm. like to go through 
late adolescence and explore your life and whatever. Yeah. And, you know, I ended up signing with the strip clubs. <laughs> uh, have a wonderful week out there to everyone on the internet. The test match season starts, restarts again into our eyes and our hearts and our minds. Uh, we'll be back next week right here on The Great Cricketer. We will see you then.